Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I am your decoder, Simon Whammers here, the former of this show. One of my writers in this case, Ilza. Thank you, Ilza, has written me a script. Have we found Noah's Ark? And we're going to uh, investigate the mystery. Was Noah's Ark real? Like, I mean, <laughs> the story of Noah's Ark that all the animals went on. It's like the literal interpretation of the Bible. It's like, no, obviously not. Or, uh, well, I mean... <laughs> It's not going to work out well. This it's just un I don't need to explain this. It's ridiculous. Um, we're going to, you know, there's often things in the Bible which turn out and it's like, oh yeah, there was this, the, you know, there's the historical part of the Bible which could be somewhat accurate and then maybe there was a big boat and all that stuff. Wasn't that a Steve Carell movie where he has a big boat? He has to build a giant ark or something like that? He's Moses or something like that? God, that's a bizarre idea. Steve Carell's great though. I'm watching The Office for the first time, somehow. And uh, yeah, it's brilliant. That's surprising to absolutely no one. It's The Office. Everyone knows it's great. Oh, the format of the show. I've not read this before. Did I say that? It's the the. It's what happens here. An angel and a demon stand side by side on the Mesopotamian plain, both in awe of God's wrath. A man and his family are loading animals into a massive boat, two of every kind, slowly making their way abroad, apparently content with their lots. Content with their lot is like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's just two of us? Wait, so we have to, and then our, the kids with the, the, it's like, oh my God, dude, Noah, no, no, Noah. Although that's okay with animals, right? Animals are all like incestuous and it doesn't mess them up genetically for some reason. <laughs> Humans are like, no, don't do that. Do you want to have an overbite the size of an orange? What is happening? The demon wonders. The angel explains. The Almighty, it seems, is a little bit miffed. I will be sending a great storm to drown everybody to wipe out the human race, except for that family on the boat. They'll be fine. <laughs> their descendants won't be <laughs> with their massive deformed jaws. The demon is shocked. The whole world? Everyone? But the angel's quick to reassure him, it's only the locals that will drown. The Almighty is not upset with the Chinese or the Native Americans or the Australians. And when the whole thing is done, the Almighty will put a rainbow in the sky as a promise not to drown everyone again. The demon is still shocked. This is something he'd consider it his lot to do. The rain starts falling. The storm has arrived. Is that the real story? Like, why, why the Australians? Why are we leaving the Australians alone? F*** them. Yeah, f*** them. The tale of Noah's Ark is probably one of the better known stories in the Bible and has its fair share of use in popular culture. Those of you familiar with the television show Good Omens would have recognized the conversation between the demon Crawley and the angel Aziraphale. I've never heard of Good Omens. However, for many, this is more than just a story. This is something that really happened. But the, the literal interpretation of the Bible just makes me a little bit like, what the f***? man and i know like whenever i mention this people in the comments be like no 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 i know people like this i know people who literally who believe like literally in the bible and i'm like there's like bible shit i already find crazy like i don't know i think i've i not well but i know like of a couple of people who've done the like no sex before marriage thing and i'm already like bro <laughs> For real, like with the reals, and they always get married really young. Obviously, um, because of course they do. But like, that's the that's the furthest that I've seen people really go down the God religion path. But literal belief in the Bible, I don't think I know a single person in my real life, and I know religious people, who who actually literally believe everything in the Bible is fact. That just seems insane to me. But how does a believer go about convincing the rest of us heathens of the truth of this tale? Well, one way would be to find the actual Ark. No, it wouldn't, because you'd find like a massive Ark and be like, oh, okay, so someone built a massive Ark. Did God send down rains and drown everyone and then there were only two of each animal in the world? E every single animal? How do you even, how do you even do that? What about mosquitoes? F*** you, Noah. Prick. Many have set out to do exactly that, and a great many came back with proof. Wooden fragments, eyewitness accounts, photographic evidence. And now that science has finally caught up, ground-penetrating radar scans. Considering the time, effort, and money spent on the search for this elusive boat, you'd expect some tangible results. Would you, though? <laughs> so today, we're looking at the quest to find the Ark and answer the question, Has Noah's Ark been found? The Story of Noah so, who was 
Noah. This renowned boat builder is a central figure in the three Abrahamic faiths Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. I'm sure most of our listeners have some idea of who Noah was, but since the story of Noah is kind of important if we want to find his ark, it is worth revisiting. Thank you, Ilza. I mean, like, I, don't, I don't know. Like, I, I'm sure I read this story of Noah's ark. I mentioned it before I went to like religious school. I'm sure it came up. But I've almost entirely forgotten it, so let's have some fun and revisit the story of Noah. The story of Noah and his ark is similar in both the Bible and the Torah. God looked upon the earth and saw only wickedness. He regretted creating mankind and decided to wipe out all living things from the face of the earth. However, Noah, being an honorable and righteous man, was loved by God and commanded to build an ark. The ark had to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high, which I don't care how big a cubit is. That is not big enough to store two of every species on earth there are where's the sperm whale going where's the blue whale going where's elephants going it's not big enough also gonna have a big fish tank in there are you noah just give him a minute also wait wouldn't they be fine <laughs> all the sea creatures did we not consider the sea creatures god they're all gonna be fine in the rain they're gonna thrive also where's all this water coming from are you gonna flood the whole world with what water maybe melt the ice caps if you're wondering about cubits we'll get back to that a little bit later god would send a flood but noah his wife his sons and their wives would be safe on the ark they also had to take a pair of every animal male and female onto the ark with them as well as a pair of every bird and things that crawl on the earth however later on it states that god commanded noah to take seven pairs of all clean animals and one pair of unclean animals so there's a bit of discrepancy there it's been suggested that this is the result of two flood myths being combined into one noah also had to fill the ark with enough food for all the people and their charges once the ark was completed in noah's 600th year Oh, just casually throwing in that Noah was 600 years old, because of course he was. Noah, his family, and the entire zoological department of Earth entered the ark and God shut them in. Then the floodgates opened from the springs in the earth and the rain started falling. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights until all of Earth to the highest mountains were underwater and all living things perished except for those on the ark. Well, well the sea creatures got. We, what's this? What about the sea creatures? The flood remained for 150 days. The water steadily receded, and the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. After 150 days, Noah released a raven, but it only flew in circles. After the raven, Noah released a dove, since doves are apparently more trustworthy, and the dove, finding nowhere to perch, returned to the ark. After seven days, the dove was released again, and it returned carrying an olive leaf. After another seven days, it was released, and a third time, it never returned, which must have been a bummer for dove kind yeah 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 so the dove f**ks off but we still got doves don't we people who take this literally how do we have doves i don't understand it how is noah 600 years old where is all the water coming from and where did it go what happened to the sea creatures bible people what happened to the sea creatures i'm not satisfied on the first day of noah's 601st year the earth was dry and noah was commanded to leave the ark where did all the water go where it just disappeared it got sucked back into the earth through those magical springs he built an altar to god and sacrificed some of the clean animals and god made a covenant with noah that he would never again send floods to destroy all of mankind the rainbow appearing in the sky after the storm is a reminder of that promise the tale of noah in the quran has a few differences Noah it is a prophet sent by allah to warn people of their imminent eradication however the chiefs wary of losing their power accuse noah of lying noah is commanded to build well, he's definitely lying about his age wasn't he noah is commanded to build the ark and he is mocked by the unbelievers for building this ark similar to the bible and the torah noah is commanded to take two of every animal onto the ark with him unlike the bible and the torah noah doesn't or only take his family he takes a small group of believers onto the ark with him one of his own sons throws in his lot with the non-believers and drowns in the flood once all the non-believers have drowned, Allah stopped the rains and halted the flood. I didn't see any reference to ravens and doves, and the ark came to rest on Mount Jury rather than the mountains of Ararat. While Noah's ark is probably the best-known version, it's not the only story that involves floods, big boats, and a select few surviving. There are over 250 flood myths across the globe. Basically, every culture has one. One of the earliest versions, and one some scholars consider to be the tale Noah's ark is based on, is the Epic of Gilgamesh. The epic poem tells the story of Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, and was written sometime around 2150 BCE and 1400 BCE. The legend goes that in his search for immortality, Gilgamesh came upon Utnapishtim, 
I have no idea how to pronounce that. A man who has apparently achieved what Gilgamesh himself seeks. Utanus, all right, this dude, the immortal dude, I'm not going to try his name again, revealed to Gilgamesh the tale of the flood. The god Enlil decided to send a flood to annihilate mankind. A bit of an extreme reaction to overpopulation, but the god Ea warned the immortal dude to build a boat and give up his wealth in favor of collecting living things to take with him onto the boat. He did as he was told, and when the flood came, he took his family and the collection of living things onto the boat. The storm raged for seven days, the earth was flooded, and every living thing died except for the one safely aboard the immortal dude's ark. The boat finally lodged itself on Mount Nimush. <laughs> oh, the Bible plagiarized. You stole this story, Bible. Come on now. Everybody was doing a white pick on me. On the seventh day, after coming to rest on Mount Nimish, uh, the immortal dude released a dove, but it returned, finding nowhere to perch. If this dove gets an olive leaf. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Plagiarist Bible. Next, he released a swallow, but the swallow also returned, finding nowhere to land. Finally, he sent a raven, which didn't return, presumably having found dry land. Really? Or it just drowned? <laughs> it gets lost. There's nowhere to land because it's just water and it drowns. The immortal dude and all living things on the boat disembarked, and he sacrificed a sheep to the gods. For his obedience, both the immortal dude and his wife were granted immortality. Oh, wait, sorry, it wasn't the immortal dude. It was the dude who was looking for Im immortality. Oh, I'm confused. It doesn't matter. Look, it's basically the same story as the, 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 the Noah story in the Bible. Clearly plagiarism here. There are a great many similarities between the tales of Gilgamesh and Noah. Yeah, no shit. If I had wrote the ta epic of Gilgamesh, and then some dude came along and was like, bro, I wrote this book called the Bible, I, I would be like, bro, <laughs> cease and desist, bitch. You ain't selling that it, that is my story for if my name is not Gilgamesh. Wait, was the book written by Gilgamesh or is it just called The Epic of Gilgamesh? I think it's just called The Epic of Gilgamesh. Who wrote The Epic of Gilgamesh? Hey Siri, who wrote The Epic of Gilgamesh? Okay, some dude, Ocuslav Martin or something like that? Really? <laughs> Never heard of him. I'm so uncultured. Let's carry on. The gods send a flood. The chosen and righteous man is called to build a boat to take representatives of all living things on board. All mankind is annihilated. The boat finally wedges on a mountain. The dove, the raven, the sacrifice. Since the Bible was written after the Epic of Gilgamesh, many scholars believe the story of Noah was a retelling of the tale of Gilgamesh, but adapted to a monotheistic religion. A retelling, huh? I'm gonna, I'm gonna retell the tale of Harry Potter in slightly my own words and sell billions of copies. Hey Siri, how many? Sales of Harry Potter of the bin. Siri is currently spelling Harry Potter to me. Why did you tell me how Harry Potter spelled Siri? Why, why is Siri so shit? Another flood myth thought to have influenced the biblical accounts of Noah is the Sumerian tale of King Zayusudra, or whatever, King of Surapak, who also happened to be a seer. After witnessing the god's council and realizing something catastrophic was coming, he's visited by the god Enki, who confirmed what he already expected. This sounds Enki, it's a sutra. It sounds like I'm reading like a Marvel story. From there, the tale is similar to the story of the immortal dude, or I don't know, the dude previously built the ark. Who gives a the king builds a boat, survives the flood, and gains immortality. When you look at other flood myths, and I read a bunch of them, in many of them the same motifs repeat. However, not all myths are cataclysmic levels of destruction. Some myths limit the flooding only to a certain area, like a village, or in one instance, a disobedient son's land became a lake. That sounds a lot more believable. So what happens in your flood myth? Oh, my backyard flooded. What happens in yours? God rained down enough water to flood the entire earth, including Mount Everest. Which definitely wasn't called Mount Everest and all that shit back then. And only a bunch of incestuous animals and people survived on a boat. And there was a dove and a raven or some shit like that. And some dude killed a sheep. Bam. Some stories take on characteristics of the places that, where they're told. After much digging, I came across two African flood myths that not only include an ark, but also birds. However, the birds are vultures and a hawk rather than doves and ravens. Apparently, Noah wasn't the only one to build himself a really big boat. Was there an ark to begin with? Before we can go looking for an ark, we need to consider another question. Was there an ark to begin with? One of the biggest problems with the search for the ark and the flood narrative in general is the idea that it was a global flood. An all-destructive global flood isn't something I think life as we know it would have been able to come back from, not only with eight people 
and a boatload of animals, and science seems to agree. There are a number of problems with the global flood, the main being that there isn't enough water in the atmosphere to allow a flood of that magnitude. If there was a flood like that, the ground would have been saturated, so we're talking about floodwaters deep enough to cover all mountains, including Everest, evaporating in less than a year. And well, where did all of that water go? While there is no archaeological or geological evidence of a global flood, scientists agree that a localized flood of sub-magnitude isn't outside the realm of possibility. One interesting theory is that a comet struck the Earth around 5,000 years ago off the coast of Madagascar. These ensuing tsunamis hitting coastlines across the world caused by the impact is the source of all the flood myths. Some archaeologists also suggest that there might have been a global flood on the floodplain between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Mesopotamia, today Iraq, which gave rise to all of the flood myths, including Noah and his ark in the region. The Sumerian king list indicates a flood in the beginning of the third millennia, as history is divided into the reign of the pre-flood kings, starting with Eridu, and the reign of post-flood kings, starting with Kish. Clearly, there was a catastrophe of note in Mesopotamia early in the third millennium. However, there is no proof that this catastrophe was global. According to geologist Carol Hill, if you take the Bible at face value, the Bible itself doesn't mention a global flood either. I'm not a scientist, but I do know language. Language is far more than a system of symbols and sounds. History, culture, and context play a big role in constructing meaning. Moses, generally accepted as the writer of Genesis, didn't know about Australia, Africa, or the Americas. He wasn't familiar with Native Americans, Chinese, or the sand people in the Kalahari Desert. He'd also probably never have seen llamas, panda bears, or blue whales, and I imagine he might have been rather surprised by the platypus. When Moses talks about a flood covering the earth, he meant his earth, which at that time was very small. The Hebrew word used for earth, Eretz, literally means earth, ground, land, dirt, soil, or country. People in the time of Noah and Moses didn't yet understand the concept of a planet. Why would they have a word for a concept that simply didn't exist yet? Noah's world was essentially Mesopotamia, a flat alluvial plain surrounded by mountains. While Moses would have known about Egypt, it's unlikely that he understood the idea of an entire continent the size of Africa attached to Egypt. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 10, God called the dry land Earth. It seemed to me like God is being very specific. Yeah, that's a great point. These dudes didn't realize there was a whole big world out there. <laughs> like, that wasn't discovered until much later. <laughs> much later. A local flood would also explain the animals. If we accept that Noah took two of every animal, we're talking about thousands of animals. And that's if you don't include the dinosaurs and some creationists want to. Oh god, yeah, that throws in an extra spanner into the works, doesn't it? Because if the Earth is only 6,000 years old, is that right? Then everything that's ever lived has to have fit into that 6,000 years. And, which is obviously insane, the dinosaurs were like 70, 80 million years ago, something like that. I mean, it's, I know it's a broad stretch, but like, roughly. So all of that Okay, so Tyrannosaurus rexes, giant megalodons, and all of that shit had to go on this boat. Come on, this is ridiculous. This boat would be well, just really big. Be a really, really big boat. Arguments have been made that Noah loaded two of every family rather than every species, and that animals mutated into the variety that we have today, which sounds suspiciously like evolution, but that's a whole different can of worms. <laughs> oh god, you've dug yourself a hole with that one, haven't you, creationists? Regardless, that's a lot of animals for eight people to take care of. Also, not all species had relations in the Middle East. The capybara natives of South America would have to get all the way to Mesopotamia for no apparent reason, hop on a boat, cruise around for a year with a bunch of hungry carnivores and then canoe back home after the unwanted cruise without leaving any trace of its passing. The Bible does make a point of mentioning miracles, but if there were any miracles involved in finding and keeping all the animals, the writer of Genesis neglected to put it on paper. That means that Noah had to go out and gather all of these animals himself. Since he didn't yet know about the existence of Australia or the Arctic, how would he have known to go there? Even if the continental plates only shifted after the flood, I'm pretty sure the discovery of ice fields and penguins would have been extraordinary enough to merit some mention in ancient texts. They're hardly a common bird in the Mesopotamian landscape. However, if the flood was local, only animals local to the area would have been on the Ark, and that's a much more manageable number. A global flood would also have been disastrous for marine life. A sudden influx of flesh, fresh water into the ocean, or the ocean spilling salt water into freshwater lakes and rivers would have upset the ecosystem enough that most of the world's species would have died out. <laughs> Holy shit, if we just mix the salt water and the fresh water together. <laughs> Ah, that's a lot. That's if the sheer weight of the water didn't crush them first. This 
I mean, I feel like most stories come from a place of truth, right? When you have like, let's say the start of the Epic of Gilgamesh or whatever, there probably was a really big flood somewhere. Like someone's entire town flooded. And there was some dude who was like, let's build a big raft and let's get all of the, you know, let's get some sheep onto there. Let's get some llamas onto there. Let's get all these animals that we need so we can repopulate them afterwards. Let's get them all onto this big raft so that we, they can survive this flood and then we'll get them to breed afterwards. See, completely reasonable story. The thing and then over thousands of years morph into the crazy story that is Noah and his giant ass ark with every species in the world. That that kind of makes sense to me. So to look for that giant raft, yeah, we could do that. The Bible instructs Noah to load animals and food for his family and their charges. However, the Bible doesn't mention anything about taking seeds and saplings to repopulate the forests of the earth, at least not the version I read. If the globe was covered with water for almost a year, most, if not all, living plants would have drowned. Some seeds can remain dormant for decades. The oldest seed to germinate was a 2,000-year-old date seed. However, being soaked in water for a year is not the ideal conditions if you want to preserve seeds, unless you're planting seaweed, that is. Of course, cataclysmic disasters are plentiful in the historic record. The eruption of Mount Vesuvius, the eruption of Krakatoa, the Black Plague, Brexit, and Donald Trump, to name a few. So a catastrophic flood decimating the Earth's population to some extent isn't entirely impossible. Even today, hundreds, if not thousands, of lives are lost annually across the world due to flash floods, tsunamis, and other disasters involving lots and lots of water. I'm inclined to believe that our ancestors came to the shocking conclusion that, well, a boat is a good place to be in a flood, and if you have a chance to load some of your livestock on while you're at it, your future looks relatively rosy once the water subsides. Ark Fever so you're convinced the ark is real and you wish to go on an expedition to find it you'd not be the first dear listener in fact so many people claim to have found the ark that new expeditions and their findings don't even make the news anymore yeah if i read that i'd be like slow news day guys it's like john starts looking for noah's eye I'd be like <laughs> okay daily mail <laughs> really well, that's the story we're going with but where to start their search there are a great many possible landing places for the ark among them mount nasir close to the little zab river in the as sulamania region of the zagros mountains and mount nisibis located near the border of turkey and syria a more recent expedition placed the landing place of the ark on mount suleiman in the elbers mountains oh my god guys these are not small areas that you're going to be searching and it's going to be buried like underground or snow or dirt or some shit like that however most expeditions are focused on three places the dura Pinar site mount ararat and mount judy so i figured i'll focus on those on top of all the sightings by people who truly believe they found something of value there are a great many intentional hoaxes perpetrated by fraudsters hoping to cash in on arc fever i decided not to include any of those hoaxes since we have more than enough actual expeditions to look at now you and i might have a doubt about this whole affair but as far as i could tell the majority of these expeditions are truly looking for the ark and many sincerely believe that they found it of course a lot of cash is made off the search for noah's ark but we'll just chalk it up as a happy coincidence rather than intentional fraud for the most part yeah i'm not i don't think it's intentional fraud like the history channel Let's just mention the History Channel, separated from the words intentional fraud. But like, they fund a whole bunch of shows where it's like they're looking, you know, for aliens or like some treasure on an island. And they spin it into like 700 seasons, which people watch. And obviously they have adverts on it. And it's like, okay, guys, we get it. It's not a lie. I mean, it is a, it is a lie though, isn't it? Because it's not like, it's just entertainment. It's just entertainment. But it's kind of like a bit shitty, isn't it? <laughs> the Durapanar site. Probably the most famous of the Ark sites, the boat-shaped anomaly on top of the mountain in the Dogubayazit region in eastern Turkey, has been the topic of many articles and even makes an appearance in National Geographic from time to time. Even if you don't follow the search for the Ark, he wouldn't be following the search for the Ark. I have Google alerts for the search for the Ark. Or have any interest in unsolved mysteries in general, odds are you've seen it even if you don't realize what the fuss was about. Really? I don't know if I've seen this. Discovered in 1959 by a cartographer, Ilhan Dured Pinar, the site is about 30 kilometers south of the Great Ararat and is still drawing Ark enthusiasts from around the world. Many believers and explorers looking for the Ark firmly believe that we found it. However, most scientists and geologists have refuted these claims, stating it's simple rock formation that unfortunately happens to be vaguely the size and shape of a boat. However, considering its continuing popularity, it's as good a place as any to start. Mate, you can't build a boat out of rocks. Rocks sink. Well, I suppose if they were hollow enough, if you had like a big, you know, rock-shaped bowl, 
that would float because that's how it works but this isn't that it's just a rock formation how how did he make it it's a boat's made out of wood what are you talking about the length of the formation is about 515 feet that's around 160 meters and is roughly equivalent to the measurements of the ark which is 300 cubits okay so it's a big ass boat but it's not enough to hold everybody however things are already getting wonky we don't know exactly how long a cubit was the word cubit comes from the latin cubitum meaning forearm and it was measured from elbow to fingertip as with 300 cubits that's really not that Oh no, that could be. That could be. Yeah, that could be. As with most measurements requiring body parts, this makes the exact length of a cubit a bit hard to pin down. Not only that, there were two different cubits in history. The common cubit was around 450 millimeters, that's around 18 inches, and the royal cubit was around 520 millimeters, which is around 20 inches, or at least that's our best guess. So, which cubit did Noah use? Considering that the size of the formation is one of the major plot points when it comes to convincing the world that this is the Ark, that's a fairly important detail. There's also a solid argument in favor of using one measuring system. Let's not confuse future archaeologists and stick to using the metric system honestly i think we're all past the age of using body parts rant over we're here for the arc so let's get back to it yeah i agree metric system like i don't know i still use imperial system for some shit like what do i use it for the discoveries of ron wyatt Probably one of the most ardent believers of the Ark at the Dura Pinar site must be Ron Wyatt. In September 1960, Life magazine ran a story about a boat-shaped formation in the mountains of Ararat. Intrigued by the possibility of it being Noah's Ark, Wyatt spent the next 30 years researching not only Noah's Ark, but a number of other biblical mysteries as well, since most of the research at Dura Pinar seems to either be based on or at least inspired by the work done by Wyatt, it's worth taking a look at what exactly he found and oh boy did he find a lot on august the 9th 1977 wyatt and his two sons arrived in istanbul needless to say things were rather different back then turkey was not exactly a tourist hotspot very few people spoke english and public transport wasn't what it is today it took them almost four days to make their way to dogu bayezid and due to the language barrier they still didn't know where to begin looking for the formation reported on in that life article this is this is not only 1977 though this isn't that long ago i mean it's like 50 years ago, 40 something years 45 years ago um 35 years ago 45 years ago 45 years ago i was just trying to tie it into my birthday and then i accidentally thought that i was 45 but i'm not i'm not quite 45 um it's cool whoever these dudes are like i read this thing in life magazine now i'm gonna do an expedition to turkey to try and find it what is your life and i like it so according to the wyatt museum website they did the only thing they could they prayed about it asking for the taxi taking them to dog it to stall at the place where they needed to start looking not exactly the scientific method but whatever floats your ark i suppose the taxi stalled three times i would have chalked this up to poor maintenance but wyatt was more optimistic every time the taxi stalled he and his sons would use small stone piles to mark the spot the very next day they started their search at the third pile intending to work their way back to the first starting at the first pile they walked away from the road in a perpendicular line into the unknown and surprisingly they found something on that first day with the help of local villagers acting as guides they came across the anchor stones this is i already know where this is going this is just going to be one of those tales where it's like dude goes looking for something very specific and does everything he can to imagine that he's found that very specific thing like if you go looking for a moon-shaped rock or formation in the woods you're gonna find that moon you're just gonna wander around for a while and be like found it that's it and people are gonna be like it doesn't really look like a moon does it and be like oh dude look at that it does come on the drogue stones or anchor stones found in the area are a big selling point for noah's ark drogue stones were the ancient equivalent of storm anchors they're large flat heavy stones drilled with a hole at one end for the rope the stones found by wyatt and his sons had carvings of crosses on them exactly eight the villagers seeing their excitement showed them some more stones and the stones had eight crosses the one that only had six crosses had obviously been broken so the other crosses were lost of course this is proof that the drogue stones that found at the site were from noah's ark as the crosses represent noah and his family <laughs> again man goes looking for something specific and he finds what he wants i'm no historian but to me the crosses appear to be in the style of the knights templar while mount ararat and the dogobazit region is not on the route of the Cru is not on the route the crusaders took to jerusalem many of the crusaders did pass through turkey and i wouldn't be surprised if they shopped around for some new recruits or just went out of their way to convert some of the locals to the brand to their brand of faith while they were in the neighborhood so not only are these crosses themselves suspect historians have pointed out that the stones are not anger stones but turkish standing stones used by 
ancient tribes for astronomy and as calendars. The hole drilled in the top is used for sighting, and the stones can be found in other parts of Turkey as well. They're not limited to the Mount Ararat region. In my honest opinion, that makes them far more interesting and a significant part of the local culture and history. Yeah, ancient tribes doing astronomy with these things is way more interesting. They were the anchors for a big fictional boat. Aye. On the second day, walking from the second pile of rocks, Wyatt and his sons made another great discovery. Great discovery. Still no boat, but they did find a very old stone house with adjacent stone fencing and animal pens. They also found two large stones they interpreted as not just tombstones, but the tombstones of Noah and his wife based on some carvings. On top of that, they found a very large rock that they considered to be an altar, complete with rock fencing indicating pens and two stones with chiseled basins possibly used to bleed animals before the sacrifice on the big altar. So, now we have anchor stones, Noah's house, his grave, and an altar fully equipped for sacrifice. Oh my god, man goes looking for things he wants to find. Jesus, this is like one of the best examples of this I've ever seen. On day three, Wyatt found the stone formation that they'd come all the way to Turkey for and excitedly decided that it found the remains of Noah's Ark. However, it was only in 1979, two years after his first visit, that an earthquake in the region fully revealed the Ark properly and a great many expeditions followed. Wyatt theorized that the Ark did initially land on Mount Ararat, but in time, due to an earthquake and a landslide, the ark slid down the mountain to its current resting place near Dogobazit and impaled itself on a wedge of white limestone where it still remains to this day. During, after its delightful slide down the side of a mountain, the ark was covered by a volcanic lava flow that protected it against erosion and weathering. In time, water seeping through the layer of protective lava leached out elements such as iron, magnesium, and titanium, allowing the wood of the ark to petrify. In my humble opinion, a lava flow will destroy everything in its path, including a wooden boat. But I'm just a writer. I'm not an ark explorer. Yeah, it's like you gotta lay a piece of wood. I've been to like the, um, I've been to a volcano and seen the lava flow. You throw some shit into that, it is gonna catch fire. Like it's not being preserved under the lava that lava is destroying it the earthquake of 1979 exposed evenly spaced indentations suggesting ribs to further bolster the theory of the ark Wyatt also discovered petrified wooden beams essentially nice rectangular blocks of black rock which showed three different layers in a cut section and was described as plywood that had obviously been glued together since the ark was made of gopher wood and we don't actually know what gopher wood is the guess that it's as similar to plywood is as good as anything this was sent for analysis at Garbraith laboratory and the results showed elements of iron aluminium and carbon a rippled rock was also found near the site and was described as fossilized reeds or bark and even sounded hollow when hit with a hammer so had actual proof of an ark finally been found why is that why would that rock be hollow i don't understand according to petrologist according to petrologist lawrence collings the answer is a resounding no after analyses of 12 different sections taken from both pieces of petrified wood both pieces were proven to be either basalt or andesite volcanic rock so no it wasn't preserved it's not a fossil it's just rock and you don't build boats out of rocks the so-called glue holding the supposed pieces of plywood together is most likely calcite or siderite the rippled rock that was apparently a bundle of petrified reeds consisted of layers of pyroxene and olivine crystals so once again no petrified wood here why would you send this to a lab it's like this is the 1970s it's not like this was discovered in the 1500s and they were like it's noah's ark no one can prove us different it's the 1970s you find it you send it to a lab and they're gonna be like yeah but mate it's not if you really believe do these people really believe that they found the ark are they actually convinced of this because it seems like to me it's like it's a scam it's a con you can't possibly believe this because it's too ridiculous but maybe they do actually believe it and they're sending it to this lab expecting it to be verified which is beyond insane when you consider that they found these things by their car stalling people told them that they weren't these things and they still remained resolute it's just so absurd that i think it's a scam but i think now that it's not and they genuinely believe this bizarre to me because the crystals are so closely interlocked the rock vibrates when it's hit with something like a hammer making it sound hollow now for those of you wondering petrology is a branch branch of geology and focuses exclusively on rocks and since collins holds a phd i'm inclined to believe that he might know what he's talking about collins felt that the boat shape was simply the result of erosion of the bedrock by landslide debris but petrified wood wasn't the only weapon in wyatt's arsenal using a metal detector ron wyatt 
Lance, John Baumgardner, and David Fasold found iron artifacts at regular intervals in what they assumed to be the walls along the length of their arc. Metal flakes were also detected at the ribs of the arc. They came to the conclusion that these were rivets, washers, and brackets used by Noah to keep his big boat together. Chemical analysis done by the Los Alamos National Laboratory and the Galbraith Laboratory in Knoxville, Tennessee, indicated that these artifacts were composed of iron, magnesium, manganese, aluminium, and titanium. Of course, this would suggest that Noah was able to forge alloys of these metals well before it became possible for your standard blacksmith. However, that's not the only problem. <laughs> it's a fairly substantial problem. <laughs> Magnetite grains deposited in cracks and fractures in the rock by rainwater could oxidize into iron-rich limonite, which would be picked up by a metal detector and might look like iron brackets. A thin section of these washers and brackets should have been tested, but initially no one bothered to do this. Much later, a thin section of the bracket was finally tested, but it didn't contain any actual metal. It was composed of altered magnetite grains cemented together with limonite. Also, as Collins pointed out, if the arc was indeed constructed with iron rivets, washers, and brackets, the Ark discoverers should have found hundreds of these artifacts lying around, not a single bracket, and one or two rivets. Yes, indeed true, but also when you found out that they weren't really metal, that was also enough. <laughs> <laughs> evidence is strong enough because there's no evidence the other way. Above the ark site, higher up the mountainside, Wyatt found what he believed to be the bottom of the ark and a strange piece of rock that was similar to a piece of rock that he found at his original site. He came to the conclusion that this was the ballast of the ship. Of course it was. Going further up the mountain toward the Iranian border, Wyatt also came across the broken remains of an ancient stele, essentially a stone slab depicting three forms of writing. The most legible segment showed the unique ridge just above the side of the stele, a mountain peak in the distance, a ship with eight faces in it, and several animals. Wyatt excitedly decided that this meant this was the original landing place of the Ark. This is entirely possible, of course, however, this doesn't prove that the Ark actually landed there, only that someone believed it enough to put up a marker in the place where they thought the Ark had landed. Can't we carbon date that somehow? Like the carvings? Would that be possible? How would you do that to work out when it was carved? Hmm, maybe you can't, because carbon dating relies on stuff trapped in there right you couldn't tell when it was carved or well, maybe you could scientists are big brain they probably figure out a way to do that let's do that and find out whether this is god do we even need to bother <laughs> obviously it's not from when Noah was around. These discoveries are fascinating and might seem pretty airtight to some. Yeah, some people who've smoked too much meth, maybe. However, there are two concerns. The first is that Wyatt was not an archaeologist, a geologist, or a chemist. While he worked in a lab for four years, he was a certified, registered nurse anesthetist. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you have to have certain degrees in order for your work to be valid. Anyone can do research on a topic, and occasionally amazing discoveries are made by laymen in the field. However, having training definitely helps you to evaluate what you're looking at. Wyatt set out to find the Ark that he decided was there, and not only did he find the Ark and the Ark's anchor stones, he found a whole lot of other things along the way to prove, in his mind, that Noah lived in the area after the flood. Noah's house, Noah's tombstone, and an altar for sacrifice. Again, man goes looking for something, and he finds what he's looking for. It's... It, it, this is it. This is brilliant example of this. However, no one has ever confirmed that these artifacts were related to Noah at all. Secondly, if Wyatt only discovered the Ark through persistent research, that would be one thing. However, he also claimed to have discovered the exact location of the Red Sea Crossing, the Ark of the Covenant, Goliath's sword, and the Tomb of Jesus, among other things. Oh my god, dude. This whole thing, it's not some ego trip I'm on, is it? I think he just, I don't think he's a fraud. I think he genuinely believes that he's discovering these things. And maybe he's just a bit dim. I think it's more likely just he's a bit dim. Or like so, or just incredibly delusional. A proper archaeological dig can take years. And some archaeologists will spend their entire career on one site or one artifact. Wyatt was a great storyteller, certainly. But I doubt that he ever found anything of true value. Despite all the proof that this is really just a rock formation, expeditions to the site continue. The most recent search was launched in 2021 by the History Channel. Not really, it was launched by the Noah's Ark scans. 
project which wanted to prove once and for all that the dura pinar site is the final resting place of the ark according to researcher andrew jones and dr fatty ahmed yuxel of the department of geophysical engineering and applied geophysics of istanbul university of istanbul university a man-made boat structure has been uncovered with 3d scans using ground penetrating radar and electrical resistivity tomography which basically means dropping electrodes into boreholes wait this sounds like totally real things and these guys appear to be real scientists so what's up okay since this technique is apparently mainly used to determine the depth of groundwater and identifying clays i'm not entirely sure that's relevant to finding a petrified ship but i'm not a scientist the team claims that the structure matches the dimensions of the ark as described in genesis however we already determined that we're not entirely sure what those dimensions were apparently the new data shows clear parallel lines and angular structures between 8 and 20 feet down that's around two to six meters the researchers feel that this is not something you'd see in a natural rock formation but that's not simply not true just take a look at the giants causeway in ireland this remarkable formation is the result of volcanic activity not human intervention but these guys are like real scientists it's dr so-and-so and researcher andrew jones they're at the geophysical engineering and applied geophysics of istanbul university that sounds like a real thing using real technology i don't believe i i totally believe that they must have some sort of ulterior motive here or like that they're relig they're trying to get their science to fit their religion or something like that but i feel like we need to like who are these people in an attempt to preserve the site due to the continued interest the turkish ministry of culture has declared the site a national park and built a visitor center now called the noah's ark museum maintained by the wire foundation however despite the most recent claims no excavations have been approved yet since the site has become quite the attraction i don't blame turkey for not allowing anyone to dig it up and possibly kill their goose with the golden egg so i guess we'll have to be content with rock analyses and 3d scans for now yeah okay so there's the rub isn't it it's like the turkish government the turkish university or whatever is very interested in this being true because it's good for tourism which is a conflict of interest mount ararat so i think we can all agree that noah's ark is not at the durapanar site instead some believe that the ark didn't slide down the mountain at all and can still be found resting atop mount ararat kurdish tribes tend to their flocks on the lower slopes of ararat but many natives refuse to go higher than a certain point claiming there's a magic zone and that noah's ark is up there but god doesn't want anyone to reach it yet regardless of this multiple expeditions have gone up the mountain trespassed into the magic zone and found the one thing that god apparently didn't want mankind to find yet no wonder we were kicked out of the garden of eden on mount ararat also known as massis in armenian and agri dag in turkish is a 5165 meter tall mountain that is tall that's 17,000 feet that's a big mountain i've never heard of this <laughs> embarrassingly it's an ice cap mountain peak in eastern turkey close to the borders of iran and russia there are two peaks sitting next to each other which are often referred to as greater ararat and lesser ararat on the northwest side of greater ararat a series of glaciers flow into a permanent ice field the thing about mount ararat is that it's a dormant volcano that last erupted in 1840. admittedly it's not exactly mount st helens but it's not nor but it's not entirely stable either and this is a rather important detail for a time there was a firm belief that mount ararat formed during the flood however there are pretty big differences between a mountain formed by underwater volcanic activity and a mountain formed on land since this is a bit of a long script already i'm not going to go into a geological comparison of stratovolcanoes and submarine volcanoes suffice to say that people smarter than me can tell the difference based on the radioisotope age of the volcanic rock ararat formed some 1.7 million years ago thus placing it in the ice age which makes it a relatively new geological feature in mountain years even creationist geologists <laughs> really creationist geologists that's actually a thing uh, any scientific field starting with creationist refers to a school of thought that considers the biblical timeline to be accurate they've come forward stating that ararat is clearly a post-flood mountain some biblical scholars claim that the story of the ark happened 5,000 years ago how they got to that number i don't know but now we're saying ararat is 1.7 million years old but still only appeared after the flood and look i'll be honest i stopped trying to keep track of the age of the earth argument when i did my script on dragons suffice to say that different schools of thought within christianity have different ideas about how old the earth is and when noah built his ark and we'll leave it at that okay good 
because I'm already confused. The important takeaway is that many feel that Mount Ararat did not exist when Noah and his family hopped on a really big boat, and even if it did, it wouldn't have been very it would have been very unstable, so it's unlikely the ark could have landed on it. Now, this isn't the only problem with Mount Ararat. Many Ark believers have pointed out a clear misinterpretation of the scripture. The Bible states that the Ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Plural, mountains, not Mount Ararat. Many scholars, that's a, you could be searching a long time for something that's not even there, guys. So many people are wasting their lives on this. It's mental. Many scholars believe that Ararat, as mentioned in the Bible, refers to the kingdom of Aratu, and Mount Ararat wasn't a part of this kingdom when Genesis was written. The kingdom of Aratu was a mountainous region in northern Mesopotamia, today Iraq. It was a small kingdom, and while historians aren't entirely clear where exactly the northern border was, it's generally accepted that the northern border was quite a bit south of Mount Ararat. The kingdom grew around the 9th century CE until it included Mount Ararat. Some people believe that Mount Ararat was suddenly part of Aratu in the time of Ezra, the writer of the Book of Ezra, around 440 to 300 BCE. Ezra worked on final edits of the Book of Genesis while compiling the Old Testament, but by then maps looked a little bit different than they did in the time of Noah and, of course, Moses, the writer of the Book of Genesis. Now, before you start yelling at me in the comments, I'm not a biblical scholar, and apparently there's a lot of disagreement about who actually wrote the Book of Ezra and when, so this is just one theory. However, this would mean that a lot of resources have been spent looking for an ark on the wrong map. Mountain, but yet people persist. The Ark is resting on Mount Ararat, and there are eyewitnesses to prove it. Tradition placing the Ark on Mount Ararat starts as early as 290 to 278 BCE with Barossus, a, a Babylonian priest chronicler who tells the story of a flood in his Babyloniaca, essentially a history of Babylon. Many Ararat believers use Barossus as a definitive source of the first mention of a flood to prove that the flood was real and the Ark landed on Ararat. The main problem with this is that none of Barossus's works survive. We only know what he wrote through the observations of other writers who claim to have read his work, and most of it's in either Jewish or Christian interest with little real interest in historical accuracy. It's important to remember that up until fairly recently in the grand scheme of history, writers and artists were supported by patrons. Writing anything your patron didn't agree with was a sure way to get yourself fired if you're lucky and beheaded if you're not. Yeah, uh, I mean, that is definitely true in the past but it's also kind of true today like those two guys who are like in turkey super interested in like and the turkish government being like no you can't definitely can't dig that up because it's not the ark it's like you just want the part you just want the history that works out for you that still totally happens today these days writers are locked in basements and simon is unlikely to behead us so things are looking up however this means that while most ancient sources and even middle-aged sources are very interesting to read they're nearly impossible to verify most of the stories i read that supposedly proved the ark's existence were based on sermons second-hand tales heard from someone who's seen the ark and stories of pilgrims who visited the ark to scrape off pitch for good luck charms but but there are very few tales of people who visited the ark themselves that survive for that reason we're going to skip over these and focus on the tales of the 1900s which are easier to verify none of them prove the existence of the ark in my opinion but i'll let you make up your own mind so let's start with george hagopian a native armenian man who claimed to have visited the ark twice with his uncle once in 1902 when he was around 10 years old and again in 1905. not only did he see the ark he actually climbed on top of it apparently his uncle told him stories of the holy mountain with the holy ship resting at the top and one day he decided to take his young nephew to see the holy ship for himself many ark enthusiasts feel that hagopian was telling the truth and since he used the name masses which is armenian for ararat there is no doubt where the ark was resting <laughs> so you're just believing some 12 year old story because you want to believe the 12 year old story many people believe he was telling the truth yeah 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 guess who doesn't this guy and anyone with half a brain Hagopian's story was consistent throughout his life. Charlatans trying to make money from a scam often changed their story to fit with popular opinion. He was also thoroughly checked out by everyone and their dog. He had a good reputation in his town and among his family, friends, and acquaintances. A verified bank account. <laughs> okay. Although how this is relevant, I'm not entirely sure. He was also 12. <laughs> okay. And what's a verified bank account? It's like you've been ver like Twitter. <laughs> Your bank account's been verified. He also passed the lie detector test, and we all know how reliable those are. Lie detector tests are not reliable. That's sarcasm from Ilza. There's something like their 51% reliability or something, which is basically just better. It's it's one it's fractionally better than just them guessing. 
However, he never tried to make money from his experience. Of course, I have my doubts, but I'm inclined to believe that Hagopian definitely saw something and he truly believed what he saw was the Ark. This is just one of these things. He was 10 and then 12 years old, right? So he's going to be told a story by his uncle. He's going to be like, yeah, and then you stood up on the Ark and he'll be like, yeah, I did. And then that story becomes crystallized in his mind as something that actually happened to him, even though he didn't. It didn't. Because of course it didn't. Another story often used to prove the existence of the Ark on Mount Ararat is that of the Russian expedition. An article published in Rosair, a Russian magazine, told the story of a Russian airman who observed the remains of a large wooden structure in a small lake on the slopes of Ararat in 1916 while on duty over the region of Mount Ararat, Lake Van, and Lake Ermia. The Russian army could only send an expedition to look into this in the summer of 1917. A German soldier, John Schilleroff, claimed to have been a part of the expedition, made up of about 100 soldiers, and stated that the expedition did indeed find the Ark. He described the expedition as follows. About two-thirds of the way up, probably a little farther, we stopped on a high cliff. In the small valley below was a dense swamp in which the object could be seen. It appeared to be a huge ship or barge with one end underwater, and only a corner could be seen. Some went close, but couldn't get out to it because of many poisonous snakes and insects. Okay, so we saw something that looked like a boat from really far away in a lake, and only a bit of a boat. Looking, you're, you're seeing what you want to see, mate. Unfortunately, with the Bolshevik Revolution kicking off in 1917 all the way to 1923 and the general political unrest in the region, archaeological expeditions dropped very low on the priority ladder. The reports from this expedition were lost in the chaos and never properly investigated. While multiple people have heard Shilleroff tell the story and vouch the man's character, there doesn't appear to be any existing accounts from any of the other 99 men who went on the expedition. There are, of course, people who claim to have known people who went. Lieutenant Rajansky claimed that his brother, Boris Vasily Rajansky, was a member of the investigating party. Apparently, there was a Boris V. Rajansky who worked in the Technological Institute of Peter the Great and attended the Imperial Institute of Archaeology in St. Petersburg on the expedition. However, if he wrote anything about his findings, there's no record of it. Yeah, the it was my mate, it was my brother, he saw this, he saw that. It's always just like it's second hand eyewitness testimony, which is just like basically worthless. Throw it out, ignore it. Of course, that could be because the entire story was a fabrication by Floyd M. Gurley for his magazine. Apparently, he finally admitted that 95% of this account was pure fiction. What, what, what the truthful 5% was, I have no idea. Many articles by ARC believers list this story as one of many true accounts of people who saw the ARC firsthand, while many articles by skeptics claim that the story was 100% fiction and nothing about it was true at all. Look, if someone's writing for a factual magazine and they make up 95% of their story and say like, no, 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 5% of it is true. We can just discount the whole thing because they made up 95% when they were supposed to be telling the truth. So they're 95% a lie. If someone lies 95% of the, if someone says I'm 90, I lie 95% of the time, are you really going to believe them that they're telling the truth 5% of the time? No, I don't think so. Or maybe you are because they're so honest about lying 95% of the time. Or maybe that's part of the lie and it's all 100% of the time. That's confusing. Since there's no evidence for the sighting and no one else on the expedition ever made a statement to bolster the story, I am going to be siding with the skeptics on this one. Another big name in the quest for the Ark on Ararat is French industrialist and amateur archaeologist Fernand Navarra, who led expeditions to find the Ark in 1952, 1953, and 1955. On the third trip in 1955 on the northwest side of Mount Ararat, Ararat, Navarra, and his son, Raphael, hit upon gold when they reported a ship-like silhouette under the ice. Climbing into a deep crevice, Navarra discovered what he claimed to be hand-tooled wooden fragments beneath the glacier, sitting at 14,000 feet. He sent the fragments to Earth to get tested, and the results seemed to concur with the explorer. The wood fragments were approximately 5,000 years old, conveniently the estimated age for the Ark, according to some scholars. So far, so compelling. And I'm not even joking. Unfortunately, several people, among them two of Navarra's climbing companions, claimed Navarra had planted the wood there in the first place. Uh oh. <laughs> Navarra denied it, of course, during a. Navarra denied it, of course, but during a subsequent exhibition in 1969, more wood was, re was recovered only after Navarra had been left alone on the glacier. Later testing of the wood fragments, more using more accurate techniques, placed the wood around the 8th century CE. So, wherever the wood came from, it missed the flood by about 3,000 years. Dude, so you just found some really old wood and were like, yeah, this will do. This will be old enough. Did they have carbon dating back then? Maybe not. He was like, yeah, they'll just say it's really old, so it could be old enough. And then new technology comes around and it's like, oh no, I've been exposed. 
<laughs> when you when you lie, always be aware that there's like future technology that could come around and uh, prove that you were lying. So just be careful with that, you know, fake archaeologist science people. All right. In 1974, the Holy Ground Mission Changing Center of Palestine, Texas. Okay, so the, the organization is called the Holy Ground Mission Changing Center of Palestine, and it's located in Texas. Alleged, Jesus, what a name. Alleged to have a photo of Noah's Ark. Tom Kreutzer, spokesman, claimed that the group saw and photographed the ark from a distance of about 2,800 feet. That's around 800 meters. But they couldn't get any closer because they lacked the necessary equipment. I find it strange that anyone would spend the time and money to climb Ararat without making sure they have the right equipment. Regardless, the photo has been evaluated by multiple professional photographers and the general consensus is that the photo has been altered it appeared that someone may have added lines to a rock formation to make it look like a wooden structure built with planks some photographers even stated that the photo was so vague that it could be anything in 2007 and 2008 noah's ark ministries international based in hong kong claimed to have not only found but actually entered a structure on mount ararat that they were 99.9 percent sure was noah's ark they weren't 100 percent sure though apparently the team found seven large wooden compartments buried at 13,000 feet above sea level it's 4,000 meters close to the peak of the mountain Radiocarbon dated wood taken from the site showed that the structure is around 4,800 years old. Okie dokie, here we go. However, since they don't mention the lab where the tests were done, it's a little hard to confirm whether this is actually the case. Oh, you've got to send it to an external lab. Come on now. You can't just be like, yeah, 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 no, I tested it and this is the truth. We go, got anything to back that? No, no, no. Can we test it ourselves? Oh, absolutely not. No, 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 definitely not. <laughs> Come on, it's nonsense. Navarra was not the only one to find hand-tooled wood on Ararat. A lot of people claim to have found wooden arcs on the mountain. Sadly, at this point, due to the large number of expeditions and people's propensity to leave behind shrines and crosses, the various possible sites of the ark have been so badly contaminated by amateurs that the authenticity of anything found is highly suspect. However, there might be something up there. No, not an ark, don't get excited, but the ark isn't exactly the only wooden structure in history. From 800 to 1400 CE, there was a slightly warmer period, often referred to as the medieval warm period. One of the effects of the warmer weather would have been smaller ice caps and a higher tree line on Mount Ararat. While some sources claim that Ararat never had trees growing on it, there are others that disagree. Apparently, 10th century Arab geographers mentioned that Ararat was heavily forested and local villagers cut trees on its slopes. It's possible that timber buildings were built during this period, and when things cooled down again from around 1400 to 1850, the structures were covered by ice as the ice caps expanded and the buildings were abandoned. Mount Ararat has always been considered a holy mountain by Armenians. So what better place to build a monastery? Monasteries at high altitudes are not exactly unheard of. Wrong book monastery on the slopes of Mount Everest, 16,340 feet, that's about 5,000 meters above sea level. This would also help explain the wood found by Novara. The wood samples he found are more in with a warmer period allowing people to build structures on the mountain in the 1800s and 1900s the ice receded again exposing the structures that were buried beneath the ice so long ago which led to an increase in sightings if you go up a mountain looking for a wooden ark and you find a wooden structure well confirmation bias is going to do the rest yes this episode is full of so much confirmation bias the mount judy I'm sure we'll all agree that the formation at Durapanar is basalt rock, and Mount Ararat quite possibly didn't even exist at the time of Noah. So, where's the Ark? Mount Ararat only became a staple of Ark tales around the 13th century. Before this sudden rise of popularity, Noah's Ark was thought to be resting upon Mount Judy. Of course, uh, we now face a similar problem to all of the sources claiming Ararat. The sources for Mount Judy are even older, so verifying them becomes a near impossible task. To confuse matters even further, Mount Judy is the mountain of many names, including Kudi Dark, Mount Kardu, Mount Kwadu, the Gordian Mountain, the Carduchian Mountain, to name just a few. The Assyrians called it Mount Nippur. A few sources even refer to it as Mount Ararat, the reason behind that being that the Ark rests in the mountain of Ararat, which means Mount Judy and Mount Ararat is the same place. Oh my god, these names are super confusing. Okay. <laughs> so history's really confusing because it's got lots of different names. Got it. Home is where the heart is, and Ararat is where the Ark is, I suppose. However, for the purpose of this script, I'll stick to using Mount Judy since I'm sure we're all confused enough already. Yes. Preach. 
Mount Judy is a twin peaked, non volcanic mountain in the southeast of Turkey, roughly northeast of the city of Sizre. C I Z R E and 220 miles 320 kilometers south of mount ararat the twin peaks add to the confusion since ararat also has two peaks but mount judy is considerably smaller than ararat at only 2089 meters that's around 6800 feet that is a lot smaller it's also far more accessible than ararat which makes the stories of pilgrims visiting the site and collecting bits of the ark for relics and talismans far more likely the area around mount judy also has a rich ancient history Nestorian Christians built several monasteries on Mount Judy, one named the Cloister of the Ark, which was destroyed by lightning in 766 CE, and later a mosque was built on the same site. So clearly, belief in the Ark has been around for a while. Literature proclaiming Mount Judy as the final stop of the Ark is plentiful. The Samaritan Pentateuch places the landing place of the Ark in the Kurdish mountains north of Assyria. The Samaritans were a Jewish sect that separated from the Jews around the 5th century BCE. Then there's the Book of Jubilees, dated to around the 2nd century BCE, which places the landing place of the Ark atop Mount Lubar, one of the mountains of Ararat. While we're not sure who wrote the Book of Jubilees, other sources also mention Lubar, such as the Midrashic Book of Noah. Oh my god, could there be more confusing names? in this episode and some pap pap papyri pap papyri is that like papyrus papyrus paprius papyrus paprii author unknown unfortunately no one is clear on where exactly mount labar is supposed to be of course berisus also comes up again only this time the author's quoting him and those interpreting the quotes decided that berossus was talking about mount judy not mount ararat in the writing of josephus berisus apparently mentioned the name mount of cordaeans and tells of people carrying off pieces of the ark we've mentioned berossus before and here is a good example of why ancient sources aren't always reliable berossus was most likely familiar with both the hebrew text which places the ark in uratu and the babylonian text placing the ark in the gordian mountains so apparently the one scholar everyone is quoting was himself relying on other sources he never saw an ark he simply retold an existing story which which is a recurring theme in this in these decoding the unknown episodes it's like always it's just a, a second third fourth hand information from people who were not very accurate to begin with another source nicholas of damascus stated that the ark can be found atop a great mountain in armenia called baris once again there doesn't seem to be any clarity on where baris is or where nicholas got this information from however believers argue that nicholas's flood story also places the ark in the vicinity of gordian the mount judy site according to the muslim faith there is no other place the ark could be the quran specifically states that the ark landed landed on mount al judy or jabal judy and 10th century scholars al masudi historian geographer and traveler and ibn haqal geographer both mention mount judy as the landing place of the ark unfortunately i couldn't find that much information on the muslim sources in english articles so if anyone knows more about this i'd be happy to read about it in the comments some scholars claim that proof of mount judy as the final resting place for the ark can be found in noah's life after the flood you see after spending a year on a really big boat Noah retired and the only way a man with a really big boat can he planted a vineyard and made wine that does sound nice I, I, that's kind of like a vague dream of mine I'd love to like retire one day and just get a vineyard and grow grow wine. I mean, I don't want to go out there and pick all the grapes and shit myself, but like just to, you know, have a vineyard and have people who pick the grapes for you, mate. I'd just most likely to I'll just most likely be to be drinking wine, to be honest, <laughs> and living on a vineyard somewhere warm. That sounds nice, man. I don't want a boat though. Boats are a lot of work. Of course, considering the year he'd just had, I don't blame the man for needing a drink. The wine grape most likely used in the time of Noah was Vetus vinifera. This grape needs an average temperature of at least 16 to 17 degrees Celsius, 60 to 63 Fahrenheit in the summer months and winters that aren't too cold, as well as an elevation that's not too high with at least moderate rainfall. Then there's the dove and the olive leaf. Olive trees are even more picky than vineyards as they are less hardy and don't do well in hot or cold climates. They also need to grow in well-drained soil or else they drown. And this finally brings us to the dove 
that Noah sent out. The dove was released in the morning and returned in the evening with an olive leaf, so how far could the bird have gotten in a day? According to this theory, the dove couldn't have gotten much further than, say, 100 miles. That's around 160 kilometers. However, pigeons today can easily fly 600 miles. That's around 900 kilometers in a day. So, whoa! Pigeons today can easily fly 600 miles in a day. Holy shit, pigeons! That's incredible! That's the craziest thing I've read in this episode so far! I mean, there's loads of crazy stuff in this episode, but it's not true. But pigeons can travel 900 kilometers in a day. That's properly mental, pigeons. Holy shit. Why are you all like living like dirtbags in the city? Fly off somewhere warm. Come on, pigeons. Go. Save yourself. So odds are Noah's dove could have gotten quite far in the few hours it was flying before returning to the ark. However, to keep things simple, let's assume the dove decided not to leave the current time zone. The leaf it brought back proves two things. First, we're not looking at a global flood because all the olive trees would have drowned. And secondly, wherever the ark landed was an area suitable to vineyards and olive trees. Apparently, the area around Mount Judy is well so suited to both vineyards and olive trees. As soon as I can afford it, I'll go inspect the vineyards personally to see if this is, in fact, the case. Or, or maybe we were just reading into this a little bit too much. Although, like, the people still studying the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, and it's like, bro, it's been like thousands of years. Don't you think we cracked it? We studied it all, man. Like, people are still, like, digging up new things over to find new shit. It's done. Oh my god, it's so bizarre. Religion's so bizarre. While there are many arguments in favor of Mount Judy and much discussion around the historical sources supporting Mount Judy, there doesn't appear to be a whole lot in the line of exploration happening at Mount Judy. Considering all the time and resources invested in Mount Ararat, I can understand the unwillingness to search elsewhere. A lot of people would have to admit they were wrong, not exactly something the human race excels at. But who knows? Perhaps someone will climb up Mount Judy soon and bring back a piece of the Ark to settle the debate once and for all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not happening. Will the Ark ever be found? No, it's not real. I mean, maybe they'll find some big old boat, but it's not the Ark of Myth. It's going to be like back in like hours ago, whenever this episode began. We talked about the dude in his garden getting flooded and how that was a bit realistic and him building a raft. Maybe we'll find some raft that fits this historical myth. But we're not finding a fat ark that was filled with one of each species. We're just not. I'm sorry, Bible people. It's not real. It's just not. So far, no real trace of the ark has been found anywhere in the world. Skeptics believe that's because the boat is a myth and it never existed. However, among believers, the reason is very simple. The ark was made of wood. According to smart people, a high mountaintop isn't ideal for petrifying wood, and it's unlikely that any pitch used in the time of Noah to treat the wood was advanced enough to preserve wood for 5,000 years. On top of that, Noah and his family had just survived a flood. They needed to build shelter, and they needed to keep warm and cook food. The flood destroyed all the trees, but conveniently they had a really big wooden boat at their disposal. They already built an altar and sacrificed some animals to thank God for their salvation. They had no need to preserve the ark. They did need wood, though, and plenty of it. A big problem with the search for the ark is the fact that proof has a nasty habit of going missing, and eyewitness accounts are always second-hand, or in some cases the eyewitnesses themselves simply disappear. In 1948, stories abound that a Kurdish man named Resit had stumbled across the ark. However, Mr. Resit could never be found despite the offer of monetary rewards. In fact, when questioned, people in villages around Ararat didn't even know anyone by that name. Mr. Resit wasn't the only witness to disappear, and many witnesses uh, were proven to be unreliable or their stories of finding the Ark only came out after they died. Not only eyewitnesses, but documentation like newspaper clippings, photos, and written-down accounts from those elusive witnesses also keep disappearing. In 1953, George J. Green, an employee for an American oil company, took photos from his airplane of the Ark on Mount Ararat. Many people claim to have seen these photos, but after Green was murdered in 1962, the photos disappeared. At the time the photos were doing the rounds, they weren't proof enough to convince people to go and find the Ark, but once they disappeared, suddenly they were proof of the Ark's existence. No one's seeing the problem with that there. <laughs> Misidentification is another problem with many Ark tales. A lot of people claim to have seen the Ark over the years, but the majority of these stories were proven to be misidentified objects, mostly rock formations or even just shadows, especially for Ark sightings from the air. And, peep and, and even people who insisted that it was definitely the Ark couldn't find the objects again by air or foot, making their finds just impossible to verify. And let us not forget the conspiracies. 
Of course, the Ark is on Mount Ararat. The government knows this and is keeping it a secret. Since the 1970s, spy planes and weather satellites have been capturing images of a man-made structure on Mount Ararat that, of course, is the Ark. And not only is Washington holding out on us, Moscow is complicit in this as well. They may have lost that original report during the Bolshevik Revolution, though that was proven to be fiction. But when has that stopped a conspiracy theory? But in the interim, the communist regime had taken their own images of the Ark atop Mount Ararat, but they too are keeping it a secret because of course they are. I just have one question. Why? What could any government gain from keeping the existence of Noah's Ark a secret? And if the government has indeed found it, why has none of the by now hundreds of expeditions going up Ararat regularly come across a boat big enough to be seen by a weather satellite in orbit? If anyone is interested in conspiracy theories about the Ark, let me know, and I'll see if I convince Simon to do a whole script on this. But for now, I think we've heard enough about this big boat, and it's time to explore other mysteries. Yes, I'm about done with Noah's Ark. This is just nonsense. <laughs> Conclusion Why is the search for Noah's Ark so popular? Some searchers believe that proving the existence of Noah's Ark, and thus the great flood of the Bible, will turn science on its head and convince millions of atheists and practitioners of other faiths that their beliefs are all wrong and that the Bible is the only true account and thus the only true God. In my humble opinion, that is a rather arrogant assertion. Yes, oh boy, is it ever. After all my research on the Ark, I have one question. If so many believers agree that the Ark is real, the remains still exist, and finding this landing place will be a great blow for science and a win for the Bible, why aren't people working together on this? Instead, the various research expeditions are secretive, unwilling to share information with other seekers, and everyone and their grandmother who's ever gone looking for the Ark has written a book or made a documentary about it and made a good deal of money. Oh, I don't know why. Maybe it's, maybe it's the money. Could it possibly be the money? Call me naive, but isn't greed a deadly sin? Of course, the honor of being a pers the person to find the Ark would be substantial. However, the unwillingness to share information and findings means that a lot of money is being spent on duplicating efforts. If this was truly a religious pursuit to prove the Bible as the only true word of God, surely money and fame wouldn't be the driving factors. On top of that, not all expeditions have the necessary permissions. One group allegedly bribed officials and made the climb anyway after their requests were denied. It could just be me, but I'd be very wary of believing any claims about finding the Ark from a group who are willing to use bribery and bend the rules for their own purposes. If they're willing to do that, wouldn't they be willing to stretch the truth a little, claiming to see remains of an Ark where there aren't any? Not to mention that I'd expect more from a group trying to find the Ark in the name of a faith based on virtues such as honesty and integrity. Yes, but uh, religion is rarely devoid of irony, is it? The story of Noah and his ark is a lesson to believers of God protecting the faithful. For most others, it's a piece of delightful fiction, nothing more. The odds of a global flood destroying all life and the world being repopulated by eight people and only two of every animal is nil. However, the idea of local floods, not just in Mesopotamia, but across the world, and people on barges surviving the chaos is not that far-fetched. There are plenty of stories of surfers surviving tsunamis, and if a dude on a surfboard can ride out a tsunami, a family on a barge has a fair chance in a flood. So I think we've decoded this mystery. Is the story of Noah true? Who knows? There might be some fact in the fiction. However, the Ark has never been found, and I doubt that it ever will. Yeah, fully agree. And if we do find it, it's going to be a it's going to be a raft or a barge or something like that it's going to be disappointing this has been an episode of decoding the unknown thank you for watching or listening if you listen please leave a review it'd be very helpful if you're on youtube like subscribe and i'll see you next time